human being is on the cusp of the animal kingdom and divinity. Our hip stores all that trauma and fear. Gut health and abdominal breathing have a direct connection. Ayurveda treats the people, it doesn't treat the disease. It's the 10 negative emotions in Ayurveda that is a root cause of diseases. You cannot rise in awareness, you cannot evolve. If we cater to our carnal desires, we become animal-like. When Jains do Santara, when they transcend the lust for food, the lust for life also is relaxed. How do we make sure that we don't get entrapped by the entropy of the universe? Death and disease cannot be human destiny. As human beings, we are the slaves. And now science is beginning to understand and recognize the invisible part of manifestation because... Welcome back to Gut Story with Dimple Jaka. On today's episode, I have a very dear friend and a spiritual guide, Dr. Mickey Mehta. He's a globally recognized holistic health guru and also corporate life coach. He has trained several Bollywood celebrities, politicians and business leaders and billionaires on how to achieve the peak of their health. Now, the beauty of this is that he combines ancient wisdom with modern science, yoga, nutrition, breath work, and the philosophy of life. In this particular episode, he talks about gut health, breath work, disease, death, and how human beings are at the cusp of either the animal kingdom or divinity. So, which side are you oscillating? Deep dive into this conversation, take notes so you can also become the healthiest, kindest, and happiest version of yourself. And most importantly, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe to this channel and also share this episode with your friends so you can improve the quality of their lives as well. And you can also follow us on Spotify. such a pleasure to always talk to you you know I always call you a spiritual friend because I learned so much in my conversations with you and uh, I want to start off this interview with our favorite question which our guests love and our audience love what's your favorite recipe which is plant-based whole food and if you can tell us how to make it veg pulao and moong dal fry moong dal fry yeah, and I like to make my vaghar, which is seasoning myself. Really? So I take lots of ghee and then I put uh, jeera, lasun, adrak ka paste, lots of dhania, lots of rai dana, and then tomatoes, curry patta, and then of course put the dal inside. And once that shh, all that happens, a little bit of chili powder. Mm -hmm. And then I like my veg pulao loaded with vegetables. Oh. So French beans, okay. cabbage, cauliflower, carrots and uh, green peas are my favorite. So even when I eat poha or upma, I like lots of carrots, green peas and French beans. So That's amazing. Is there a reason you chose these ingredients? So certainly condiments, yeah. herbs, yeah. they are great regulators and especially the adjuvants which aid digestion mm. and when it comes with oodles of great taste like garlic ginger vaghar is always yeah. the flavoring is so good and they help you digest better so plus they have properties for immunity very nice you keep stressing on digestive health yeah it's like a big thing even in ayurveda in modern wellness now yoga we speak about gut health how important is it when you're treating your clients? Very important. And fundamentally what we do is we focus on stomach breathing, abdominal breathing. Because gut health and abdominal breathing have a direct connection. Right. Your pH balance can come to reset with abdominal breathing. Simply to begin with. Number two, when your stomach moves in and out like a balloon in a flow and in rhythm and slow... That is the time your digestive juices can peak. So when you do that 5-7 minutes before you're eating a meal, it really helps you digest better. In the mornings also, when you do your Pavan Muktasan and all the breath work and you do your Bandhas and Mahabandhas, once again it supports peristalsis and peristalsis supports easy natural bowel movements. That in turn leaves a healthy gut behind 
to better digest once again. So, breathing, yoga, Ayurveda and gut health, they all interconnected and of course, yoga and Ayurveda, they believe and it's scientifically validated that everything starts from the gut. And that is the place which should remain clean, green, regulated and fortified. Amazing. What is this abdominal breathing that you spoke about? Like, how can we do it while we're sitting, while we're talking to each other? Can you demonstrate one I will certainly do. You see babies Mm -hmm. and super senior citizens breathing. Yeah. Because they literally don't have mental weight. Mm. So, the natural breathing is abdominal breathing. So, when you're most relaxed, you go back to natural rhythm of stomach going up, stomach coming down. So, simply from here... Obviously, start your breathing activity. But remember, pay more attention to breathing out. Mm. Because the instinctive life force makes you breathe in naturally to continue and perpetuate life. But the breathing out has to be done very consciously. And each time you breathe out, the let go of the air from your body relaxes your musculoskeletal structure relaxes your autonomous nervous system, brings a calm and orientation over there, then brings your mind at in the center, brings about a kind of tranquility and continuous breathing out is also emptying your body, emptying the mind, emptying the emotions, emptying your psychology and emptying the weight of karma from you. It's because karma also has weight. So literally japa, tapa, and pranayama and mostly all breathing out, letting go. So what is blood letting in Ayurveda? When you put that leech, yeah, leech on that, it sucks out blood it is blood, and then you press and blood comes out, letting go. So what is purging? Virechan is letting go, basti is also letting go, but basti has more connotations. It also immunizes you, revitalizes you, regulates you, very many things. But letting go is very important. So, breathing out, out, out and breath work fundamental to gut health. Very interesting. A few years ago, I actually assigned a yoga teacher for one of my extended relatives and the yoga teacher came out and said, her breathing itself is wrong. I said, what do you mean? He said, she's not breathing out enough. And then he said it was connected to her anxiety, palpitations, short temper and her not feeling good about life at all. So, that was a very powerful point, you know, breathing out out. The personality gives rise to everything. So in in Ayurveda also, you see a personality into kleshas. Right. So you see avidya, asmita, raga, dvesha, abhinivesha, combination of two, combination of three, combination of five, which then births your seven sins so called. So pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, sloth. So karma, krodha, lobha, moha, madhamaya, matsara. So Ayurveda treats the people. It doesn't treat the disease. So when we look into serious inmate management, we treat the person. So you treat the person and everything will be treated. Even the breath work. Yeah. Treat the person. So you let the person, you know, go through therapies of letting go and the breath comes back to normal. You make the person breathe normally, well enough mm. and the kleshas will reduce and the, uh, you know, karma krodha will reduce gradually. But when done regularly and regularly and regularly, then it becomes a genetic memory for, to perpetuate down your progeny also. Wow. That's powerful, you know, because... Kleshas, you know, for the sake of the audience, it's the 10 negative emotions in Ayurveda that is a root cause of diseases. It's not the body, but the emotional root cause and the trigger. Absolutely, absolutely. And you're speaking about how it perpetuates progeny as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Ancestral trauma is said to be, you know, recorded in our hips because we're running out of fear away from our predators. So we run and our hip stores all that trauma and fear. Yeah. And then we pass it on to our children. Yeah. And the collective fear of all your personality for so many millions of lives you've led till day is collected in the Manipura Chakra. So which is why when you breathe out, you empty the Manipura trauma. 
and letting go. So from being absolutely fearful, which means bhai, you become abhay, nirbhay. Mm-hmm. So your double pawn muktasan, which can be doubled up with your bandhas. So you can start with, you know, your muladhar, swadishtan and jalandhar. Mm-hmm. And once you tighten yourself tight and you breathe it all out and you remain in the suspended state of not breathing in, not breathing out and there, that is the time you stabilize your chitta. And chitta shodhan happens with breathing out also. And chitta empowerment happens with breathing in. And chitta is a conscious mind. Chitta is a conscious mind. Chetan. Chetan. Chetan man. So whatever you do with chetan man in yoga, a chetan man gets influenced very naturally. And then the achetan man is not on default. A chetan man is conscious and aware too when your chetan man is. So it is not, so when the manasthiti is in place, right. the paristhiti is in control. This is so complex and rich, you know, this particular answer that you gave. Breathing helps us improve the Manipura Chakra. Absolutely. Open it up. Open it up. And that helps us improve our spirituality. So until let there go. is, until there are fears, phobias and everything here, you cannot rise. You know, you cannot rise in awareness. You cannot evolve mm. because it's you're limited, you're restricted, and then you're doing out of four F's. So fight, flight, fornicate, and food. Then you're functioning only out of your most basic root. Those are very carnal desires, right? We very, have the parasympathetic desires. nervous system which controls our feed, rest, digest. And Absolutely. then we have the sympathetic nervous system that's fight or flight mode. So human being is on the cusp mm. of the animal kingdom and divinity. So human being is on the bridge. In Sanskrit, it is said that manushya setu pe khada hai. Setu is the bridge between Pashu and Purush. So Pashu is animal, instinctive, program life, where a pedigree of dog will live 10 years, where a pedigree of cat will live 5 years, and a pedigree of tiger or whatever will live X amount of years. Mm. But human being can live for 500 years. Mm. Because Icha Mrityu is our power of consciousness. So Krishna, Christ, Muhammad, Mahadev, Zarathustra, Buddha, Sita, Saraswati, Durga, Lakshmi. They were human beings. They became gods. What stops you and me? They flowered, they blossomed. So breathe well. So Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyara, Dhyan, Dharma, Samadhi. This is the ladder of evolution. And the opposite is entropy. So time, matter, space, light, motion, mass, causation, effect. The laws of physics. The, the universal tendency of orderliness breaking into disorderliness. But the Ashta Yanga, Ashta Anga of yoga, they keep your evolution rising and entropy tries to keep pulling you down. So breathwork centers you. Breathwork neutralizes the forces of entropy. Sitting in silence, observing, meditations, getting centered, feeling one with everything, you know, alleviates our suffering. Very and, interesting. Yeah. So we are here. The animal kingdom is here. Yeah. Divinity is here. Yeah. We have to decide which way do we want to oscillate. If we dis- cater to our carnal desires, we become animal-like. Yes. And if we tame those, we become divinity. So taming is also going into them with awareness. Mm. So not instinctively, but consciously. So sex can become making love. Mm. Eating food also will bring about so much intimacy and that becomes worship. Mm. So can you imagine? So the same action transcends you into different realm of experience and spiritual growth. So a person eats food in a rush without paying attention, in anger, in agitation, you know, gulps it down. That is taking you to an animalistic attitude. But if you express gratitude... Correct your breath before starting your meal. You can move towards divinity with that same meal. Absolutely. So why in our Hindu Sabhyata, Sanatan Dharma, there is a prayer of gratitude before you eat. So Om Sahanavatu Sahanom Bhunaktu Saviryam Karvavahe Tejas Vinavadhi Tamastu Mahavad Vishadvahe. So when you say this prayer, the expression and emotion of gratitude, abhar comes out. And that prepares your gut to orient itself to receive the food that you are eating. 
and then eating and then chewing in the buccal cavity signals your gut to pour out the suitable acid pour to digest it better. So all that is so interconnected and interrelated. And I'm sure I've seen some of your videos, you're speaking about it. Mm -hmm. And Ayurveda truly so profound and yoga truly so divine. I love that. I love that you, you know, are able to link everything. Yeah. Eating food is a physical activity that we see from the outside, but is actually connected to our gut health, emotional health, mental health, energetic health and spiritual health. For those who would live on fruits only, Fructarians will not know anything but compassion, empathy, sympathy, care. Because the influence of the bhavas, gunas, yes. sanskaras will become the sanskriti. That's true. Because you know, on Mondays, we were told to do Shivji fasting. Okay, If you're in a state of chaos, confusion, you can't make a decision. I always do this. When I'm at that point or junction in my career where I can't make a decision on what next, I do Monday fasting, only fruits on Mondays. And I find that my IQ level is peaking on Mondays compared to other days. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the guna, the qualitative experience right from the taste to karma of eating a fruit is mm. divine. So I would always say that human consciousness becomes more awakened with absolute purity. Yeah. So when it sprouts, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables, and then that is the time we, I always say that human consciousness can rise above gods mm. or it can fall below animals. So you decide you want to climb the ladder of evolution. Then the choices, fundamental choice is breath. Yeah. That how do I align my breath? So without breath, the life cannot move forward. Mm. Then comes hydration. Then comes food. Then comes movement. So movement also nourishes you. Mm. So yogic movements nourish you. Mm. And then of course, meditation nourishes you the most. Yeah. Because when meditation opens you up, yeah. it allows you to flow the circulation mm. and that enhances your nourishment. Mm. And the cosmic nourishment of all the energies of the universe converge in meditation right from your sastra to downwards. And then when you bow in humility and touch your forehead to the ground, the otherwise occipital cavity which is always straight and stiff mm. opens up. Mm -hmm. And you literally take the universal download of information. everything, information, all that ever happened even before Big Bang. So, you know, you know, right from the time we were a speck, yeah. a speck of chemical on the rim of the volcano after the Big Bang, that was chemolitho autotrophic hypothermophile to the point 14.8 billion years later, mm -hmm. we've become thinking, crying, laughing, singing, dancing, praying, silent human beings, and much more. Very interesting. So I'm drawing a mental picture of what we spoke, okay? Human beings, we have the animal kingdom and hell, we have divinity and heaven, and now we have the eight limbs of Ayurveda that can take you up, or we have the entropy, time, space, matter, that can degrade you, deteriorate yeah. you, break you down. Yeah. How do we make sure that we don't get entrapped by the entropy of the universe which is orderly, disorderly, which is time, space. So, you know, when we went through healing also, they said time is a concept made by man. It doesn't exist. Yeah. So how do we not get trapped in this entropy of the universe, which will limit our lifespan? So, as I said, matter mm. is subject to decay. Because anything that is born has to die. Anything that is born has to die. It's clear. But human beings can perpetuate without dying, which means... That you can breathe the last, transform, transmigrate, reform, but not die to disease. Death and disease cannot be human destiny. Because death is the culmination of your choices. You know, so death leads you, death leads you to absolute helplessness. Yeah. And humans can be helpful. So death has no right on life. Death is the culmination of diseases and diseases are the culmination of your choices. So choose an awareness and life can perpetuate. We had human beings living for 300, 400, 500 years. Yeah. Yeah. Tightrope walk, simple, grounded, rooted. Then decay doesn't happen. Then what happens? So when, when Jains do Santhara, 
when they complete seven cycles of 12 years, seven solar cycles of 12 years each, this is 84, then they realize that I had to contribute whatever I had to, I had to take whatever I did. Now every breath out is polluting the earth and in the environment. Plus, I am consuming what I don't need because I cannot do anything for this universe. So I want to let go of my life. So that is Icha Jeevan, Icha Matthew. So they literally first stop eating for a few weeks. Now hunger, appetite, lust, everything peaks and then they transcend it. So what happens? When they transcend the lust for food, the lust for life also is relaxed. Then they stop drinking water. So the initial thirst, once they transcend, then the quest for life is also relaxed. It's so powerful because it reminds me again and again on what my purpose of life is. Okay. If I can share with you, my great-grandmother became a widow at the age of 30 with three daughters, raised them single-handedly, earned money by teaching spiritual you know, uh, scriptures to the young girls who were about to be married off. And she made money from that. She got her three daughters married off, adopted five children who lost their mother or father, had a stepmother, stepfather, had a difficult life. She adopted five children, raised them, got them married off and sent them away. Lived alone till her last. Got hospitalized once with a broken hip bone. Came back. Second time when she got hospitalized, she took up Santara. Okay. She said, my time has come. She was 95. She gave her food, water, and the monks took her in and gave a monkhood, ordained her, shaved her head, and she lasted for 24 hours in deep meditation. Wow. And then we put her in a sitting posture on the back of a vehicle, and there was a parade all over Bangalore where we were throwing color to celebrate, celebrate. her life. Yeah. Her death was not even a concept. So thing is, you know, when they choose to breathe the last... They can let go of their breath and then they can choose to enter the kind of womb and the kind of life they want to, yeah. to come back and serve or they can choose to be the colors on the wings of the butterfly or they can choose to be the fragrance of the flowers yeah. or they can choose to be the sweetness of the fruits or strength of some other, any other life's roots or they can simply come and disappear and be the ultimate infinite, eternal witness to the, the dance of energy and creation and destruction. So that's called moksha? That calls moksha nirvana. nirvana. Yeah, salvation, liberation. Then you are, you are the master. As human beings, you are the slaves. So Mahavir, jo virya ka dhani tha, who conquered, who's literally his indris, which means senses, master of senses. So you and I and everybody listening can also become a Mahavir. We all can. And this life is a good beginning. This moment is a great awareness to start once again. And you know the science of quantum healing today talks about it. Yeah. That the moment you decide that I am well, I am healing, I am whole and I will always be healthy. Yeah. That is the moment... Your hydrochloric acid pore in the stomach improves, the elimination of toxins improve, the lymph pumps begin to behave well, the heart flutters, the lungs are relaxed and they, deep, uh, they breathe deep. The changes happen instantly because your thought influences the, your biochemistry, your biomechanics and everything put together. No? So it's mind over matter, mind over medicine, mind over body. Mind is medicine. Mind is medicine. Rather, the state of no mind. The empty mind is very medicinal. Yeah. When the mind is full and clutter of you know, fog, certainly it is not. And so, this is why people who are undergoing anxiety, a bipolar disorder, stress, depression, also have poor digestive health and chaos in their career. Extremely. Super thinking mind can never digest food well. Mm. You give them amruta also, it will become amavish. Which is, poison. which is poison. Because they can't digest. How did these thinkers like Albert Einstein, you know, Tesla, and all of these survive? Because they understood the power of energy. Nicholas Tesla was the first one in the modern scientific world to say life, the reality of life is nothing but energy 
frequency and vibration where are you collecting this wisdom from why you speak because you're speaking at a different frequency your voice is vibrating at a different level what brings up change when you're speaking now versus when you're speaking to your staff or management or operational team so this comes out of certain degree of stillness tranquility equanimity and calm which you reach either by thought and your own intent and practice behavior mastery over it secondly wherever you are if you are open ended you absorb so currently i'm absorbing from your walls from your ceilings and the empty space which has been a witness to all your dissemination of your podcast and your reels that you've made out of this place for years together writing a book everything is here Absolutely. nothing ever buddha spoke or christ spoke has gone away if radioactive carbon aging mm. can be gone behind thousands of years science will one day be able to capture the words ever spoken by this actual sages and ancient in ancient ages and we will be able to reproduce even the pictures of it because the holographic model says that akasha contains it all akasha keeps it all mm-hmm. it is ever expanding ever inflaming and nothing from there will ever get erased it's so powerful that you're saying these things because i didn't obviously tell you what i've done in this space but i can figure i can sense you go to a temple yes you go to a shrine or a mosque empty yourself and then simply filling in happens mm. so what happens is when you come back you come back enriched with creativity conviction confidence you are fearless and you are bright full of solutions not full of problems life is seldom a lake it's more an ocean and ocean in motion so surfing is the art which meditation teaches you and absorbing it and compromising with the condition mm. and this compromise is a healthy compromise which means swikriti which means samarpan which means submissiveness it it doesn't mean surrender submissiveness is always happens with grace beautiful and powerful like you know i just want to tell the audience how accurate dr mickey is it is true that i've recorded a lot of content in the last year and a half in this room and the spot that you're sitting is exactly to the t where i sat and wrote my book over 6 months i'm certain that you must have correlated certain things that i said yes. and there are certain things i said for the first time probably getting inspired by the space here which yes. means your words are still there your thoughts are still there and we i simply connect we simply connect it feels like deja vu when you speak because you're saying the words that i have thought of some months ago not immediately 10 minutes ago before you arrived and it's exact same spot where i visualize some of the things that you're saying cool. and the way you're connecting the dots is like a constant reminder that energy is everything true energy frequency and vibration like what nicholas <coughs> sorry energy frequency and vibration is what nicholas tesla said yes and uh, einstein was also so intrigued by his meeting with tagore that he got so inspired with the philosophy of the ultimate divine creativity that he thought then he, he i think he said these lines that science without religion is blinded and religion without science is no groping in darkness something like that very true very true it is very potent and powerful because some of the most accomplished scientists said that humanity makes no sense without religion science makes no sense without religion and religion also makes no sense without science you have to understand the two absolutely and this is where yoga is not a religion yoga is actually a science it is a complete science perceived before science was born before science was born it's a complete science so science was until 1200 science was a part of the philosophical apex body 
So philosophy and then there was science. Then human mind, the super intellect, they separated the both and humans started walking in dark ages again. So we have this habit of dissecting everything. Analyzing it. Right? We separate things yeah. to be able to identify with Spiritually, it. Spiritually, you understand things. When you put things together, mm. meaning comes out of it. Science tries to break it into parts to understand each part's constitution, but not realizing mm. that when parts of a flower come together, there is one more thing which is more than the sum total, which is fragrance. Which you cannot make in a lab. And science misses the fragrance because it wants to observe everything from outside. Mm. And fragrance can only happen from within. Sweetness, experience happens from within. So Jalauddin Rumi always said that. I've been living on the lip of insanity, asking questions, knocking at the door. The door opens from inside. So That's the humbleness with which they were seeking answers. And that's yeah. the humbleness with which you're sharing your wisdom. Right? But... With modern science, our logical mind has become too sharp and strong and dominant. Yeah. And we only believe what we can see with the eye. Yes. What you can hear, what you can touch, taste and smell. Yeah. Anything outside of these five senses doesn't exist in science. Yeah. And at a spiritual level, we're also becoming egotistical. We have a limited sense of self, hmm. which is like a box. I identify with this box, with this person, with this physicality. And we put ourselves in a box and function from it. Does that destroy my spirituality and my growth? 100%. Because the word spirituality can be defined with Advaitya, which means formless, labelless, no identity, only eternity. So our spirit, our soul are eternal and we keep coming back. And there is a very small analogy to this that... A four-year-old playing piano very well. A seven-year-old computing math very well. A 12-year-old girl suddenly gets up in her dreams and say, I was once married there. I lived here. Takes the family there. And everything comes out to be true. So, memory precedes life. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. And science doesn't understand anything which has no form. But Schrodinger, Dr. Dean Ornish... Dr. Tony Nader. Now, these scientists have contributed a lot. And Dr. Roger Penrose. They worked on consciousness. And now science is beginning to understand and recognize the invisible part of manifestation because quantum mechanics has opened up doors to understand that. That means two particles born out of the same atom billions of light years away will know instantly what the each what the other is doing it's like a soldier dies on the front thousands of miles away at 3:30 a.m the mother wakes up with a bad dream about a son scientists in russia were much more advanced than scientists in america in in the cold war days in Russia, they, did, they were doing very many experiments. One of the experiments was that they took a baby rabbit mm -hmm. and they took the mother rabbit hundreds of kilometers away. They put the scalpel, the knife on the baby rabbit's just throat. They just touched the throat and the mother rabbit palpitations went up. So there is such a deep connect of a spiritual, emotional connect which Akasha and no space-time can divide it. It is instant. So in, in the realm of Akasha, where there is zero matter, mm. all matter has Akasha in it as a scaffolding, but Akasha is independent of it all. Everything is born in and out of Akasha. So Akasha is your teleporting. So in meditation, the teleporting point is your Akasha. You connect with the space inside, and you connect with all the realms of the world outside, all the dimensions. So, yogic science, breathing, meditation, absorption, temple, everything is about Akasha. Akashic records. Akashic records. You know, that brings me to a powerful point, a mother and child's relationship. The umbilical cord is a physical connect. It's cut at the time of birth, birth. But the emotional cord between the mother and child doesn't break for years 
until the very last breath of the mother. Yeah. And in fact, when the mother is pregnant, the child is sending stem cells, the fetus is sending stem cells to heal the mother's body of all kinds of diseases, including cancer. Absolutely. And after the child is born, the mother is creating golden milk to feed the child human milk oligosaccharides yeah. and immunity to fight this world. Can you imagine before gripe water was even born? Yeah. When a child would cry, mother would simply take the child. So first, you're secured. Mm. Number two, child's right ear on mother's heart, listening to the heartbeat calms down and relaxes. And when mother strokes the spine, the electrical charge of the head and heart coherence mm. comes to stability. So these are the wonderful things which happen with just the connect of emotions, thoughts, compassion, sympathy, empathy, care, equanimity. And just like how we're connected to our physical creator, who's our mother. So in spiritual science, we say that the child chooses a womb it wants to be born in and also True. orchestrates the love story between the mother and father so that the child can be born. The child is born with a pitra dosh, decides which kind of ancestral trauma it wants to release in this lifetime. Just like that, the child is also connected to the source energy which is several thousand years older, if you understand. If you look at the concept of time and space, yeah. several ancestors, and all that information is stored in our DNA. It's there completely. As, I, as Sadhguru says, your grandfather's nose is sitting on you. Your grandmother's eyes are seeing through you. You know? And the teeth of your forefathers are eating through you. So this also is memory, you know? Your body expressing itself of your genetic makeup, yeah. which is why we are so unique and we are not made on assembly lines like tools and cars and television sets or whatever. The uniqueness of our consciousness is expression in unique way mm -hmm. and so different, no two fingerprints could ever be the same. Even if we would have 80 billion human beings on earth, forget 8 billion. That's very powerful. Like, you know, in Ayurveda, we used to say this, that while you're in the womb, there are seven unique body types that Mother Nature first fits you into, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, dual body type, Tridoshi body type. But the minute the car leaves the you know, assembly point. It has its unique journey. Yeah. The minute the fetus leaves the mother's body, yeah. it has its unique personality from the moment it takes its first breath. The whole environment begins to influence immediately. Yeah. So initially, the environment outside the womb and inside the womb. Later on, the environment when the child is being nurtured and growing up. So environment influences the child's mm. evolution or degradation, whatever. So first seven years, the child cannot choose the environment. Seven to 14 years, the child begins to rebel. 14 to 21 years, the child begins to assert. But after 21 years, the child begins to take independent decisions and step out of the environment. Buddha wouldn't have become Buddha hadn't he stepped out of the environment. Because that environment didn't allow him to evolve. Because it was a rich, safe, secure environment, devoid of sadness, disease, death. Devoid of reality. Devoid of reality. Reality. And he had to be a part of the ocean which was in motion and not a lake which was crystal clear, still and sanitized. You know, when you say this ocean in motion, because you've said it twice and it yeah. rings multiple bells in my head when you say that. You know, we're all trying to achieve this placid, peaceful, happy life where everything is under control. You know, everyone arrives on time, the maid, the servant, the cook, the driver, your management, everybody is on time and your life is like a bed of roses. Yeah. But that's not spirituality. Ocean in motion is... That is not spirituality, you know, because you're running, you're chasing. Mm. Spirituality is when you're being, not running and chasing. Mm. You're being in the flow, you're being in the rhythm. So an artist is in the state of being, right. meditative. A singer is in the state of being. You and me currently are in the state of being. A sculptor, in the state of being, creativity 
happens. You know, our entire life, most of us live in ignorance. William Blake wrote some beautiful lines which says, we are led to believe a lie when we see from and not through the eyes for we are born in the night to be perished in the night while our souls rest in the beams of light. So, souls are full of light anyway, but the mental block, we block our light. Because we are constantly thinking, our intellect is working. Yeah. Intellect is saying, this is all that is. And soul is in a different game. Yeah. For soul, it is tattva masi. This is that, that is this, and this is all that is. That is oneness. Yeah. But the intellect is constantly compartmentalizing things and trying to understand a rose through a petal, a rose through a thorn, a rose through a stem. Whereas the intelligent is simply enjoying the rose, not trying to intellectualize it at all. Powerful state of being. Yeah. Eckhart Tolle speaks about the power of man. So, so Eckhart Tolle was influenced by the Upanishads. So in Samved, mm -hmm. which is about hymns and healing hymns, sound, resonance, consonance, it brings you, sound brings you to the state of that stillness and the power of now. So, I am grateful to Eckhart Tolle for contributing this and taking our Vedic philosophy to the Occidental. Mm. But this is how, this is how Bodhi Dharma took Dhyan to worldwide and Dhyan became Dhyan and Dhyan became Zen because Chinese couldn't pronounce Dhya. So, Dhya was Dhya. Oh. So that is how it became Zen. Z and yeah. Zen. Powerful. So India in a lot of ways has become the center of spiritual growth. It has become the birthplace of spirituality. Aristotle came to India. It is said a certain section of uh, philosophers and historians say Christ came to India yeah. and was in Munger and Kashmir. A certain section of uh, philosophers and uh, historians say that Pythagoras had come to India. Most Greek philosophers were further enlightened when they came to India. I'll give you a small example. Yes. Heraclitus says, you can never step into the same river twice. Sounds very good to the ears, but it is not a perfect Darshan Shastra. The real Darshan Shastra is that the rivers of opportunities and confluence will keep flowing. If you are alert, you step in any time. And you, you take a sip of and that. Partake, and partake in and it. And partake in it. You know, in fact, I was doing a little research on astrology. Yeah. Because I was trying to dig deep from Ayurveda to understand the root cause of diseases that are unexplained, autoimmune and defect by birth. And that's when astrology played a role. And I found that astrology was also practiced in Greece. Greek mythology, Greek philosophy, Greek science also incorporated astrology there and Vastu. So Mayan culture also practiced astrology, yeah. Chinese did mm -hmm. and more of astrology was practiced by the people in the deserts because for them the navigation was through the placement of the stars and where will the sun, which part of east, yeah. because there's a degree of deflection. Uh, from winter to summer right. slight and that's the way they would navigate so understanding the stars it came from Persia and Persians and which is why our prophet is called Zoroastrian Zoroastrian the one on the horse the one who followed the stars one who understood 95,000 years old is seemingly what astrology is before man learned how to speak and write. That's number one. Jyotish Vidya is so deep and profound. Jyotish Vidya is all about exposure. Right. If I take a picture, yeah. everything that is around, whatever it, the light is exposed to, will be captured. Mm. So when you were seeded first, yeah. and then when you were birthed, both the moments are equally important to influence each other and determine mm -hmm. your life further. So it, the shadow of the people around when you were born. If somebody was very strong, somebody was very 
Valerius, somebody was very illuminated, who took you in the hands first, who saw you first, who you connected with first. Everything is impressed upon the child's chitta. Because a child's chitta, clinical chitta is raw. And that impression translates into reaction and response with stars and planetary movements. Because they are constantly emanating light, energy, vibration, breaking, destruction, birthing. Yeah. Everything is happening as we speak. And we are constantly sensitive. We are sensitive to light. Circadian rhythm responds to light. So we are sensitive to the planetary movement also. And that influences our Everything. conscious mind, subconscious you, mind. You enter... Somebody puts, you know, covers your eyes and walks you into a kabrastan. You'll feel very eerie. Somebody covers your eyes and walks you into an orchard. You'll feel so pleasant. Yes. You are sensitive to energy. Very powerful. And you absorb it. But people who have mastered the art of meditation, they become like a lotus in the muck. Mm -hmm. They're not bothered. They become like lotus in the muck. They don't get influenced by the environment. They are neutralized. Very powerful. You know, when I was in New York, my host was a Polish lady and I had a deep connect with her. And her sister was a doctor. And she would say, oh no, tomorrow's a full moon night. I will be in the hospital all day. I was like, why would you say that? She said, on a full moon night, we have the maximum number of ER cases, emergency cases. A seasoned carpenter will end up nailing his finger. A seasoned driver will end up having a car crash. Some of the worst things would happen on a full moon night for those who are not conscious. The lunar cycles yeah. influence the human mind. Mm -hmm. The tides of the ocean influence human minds. Right. The whole circle and cycles of seasons, Ritu. Mm -hmm. Why there is Ritu Charya? Mm -hmm. And why there is different Din Charya and different Ritu? Huh. For a simple reason, our sages understood mm -hmm. Non-reactive behavior, non-reactive choices of food, non-reactive life. So that the Ritu responds to you. Mm. So lunatics were called out of people who get influenced by lunar cycles. Mm. Yeah, you must know that whenever there are solar flares, ladies become anemic. Yeah. It influences the blood levels. Influences the blood levels. And those pharaohs, skin yeah. disorders. Yeah, also pharaohs experience. had done a study of 4,000 years on solar flares. 99 years of solar flares peak. Hmm. And then, the, you know, that the sun is aging. And then after the flares, the sun is reborn and it's birthing again. Then again it peaks. Now, in these 99 years, every 11 years and 11 months, hmm. there is this one cycle. Which is why we have Kumbha. So in the radiation peak of the solar flares of the 12 years, you need to dip inside the running rivers, not lakes. Running rivers coming from a particular source of mountain, which can neutralize the radiation on human aura, of human aura. And that's why we have the Kummela in India, where ascetics Absolutely. were completely naked, yes. with ash smeared all over their body. Absolutely. Jump in that room. Dipping inside and becoming one with the energy, ever volatile energy outside. And neutralizing it. This is a paradox. One is becoming one, which means receiving it, accepting it, submissive to it. And neutralizing it. Because of that, then the elements work on you. Talking of paradox, last year I went to Varanasi. My first time ever. And I was shaken to the core because the same river where they were throwing the ash of the dead and they were burning and cremating. On the same river, I saw people taking a dip, calling it a holy bath. And on the same riverside, there were people getting married and newborn children were getting their heads shaved. Like one-year-old child, six-month-old yeah. child. The entire cycle of life and death was playing in a radius of literally just 100 to 200 meters for me, from yeah. one corner of the eye to another corner, I could see all the stages of life being played there. The dance of creation and destruction, which matter is subjected to always, to which we are the witness. And if our witnessing is without being opinionated, our evolution goes towards liberation. It's diabolic. It's a paradox. Even for a person 
like me, a brown person born and brought up in India, even for me, it gives me chills down the spine sometimes. The nature of reality is contradiction. You know, the Upanishad mm -hmm. and Tao, yeah. the Chinese philosophy, Tao, the pronunciation is Tao, but T-A-O, Tao teaching philosophy. It is said that without the opposite, you cannot exist. Without the opposite, you cannot resist. Opposite is there as your reality and respect, regard and reverence to the opposite brings you at terms with life, which is why you remain neutral to anything. How can you influence the youth who are listening to you right now to achieve that neutral? Because I know your first book was yeah. the Shunya Quotient. The Shunya Quotient. Which is so powerful. Let me tell you, the Shunya Quotient is basically a book uh, Dr. Mickey Mehta wrote uh, where he speaks about the power of zero, the state of zero. And we seem to neglect that idea or not even consider it as an idea. Yeah. Because we're an overachieving society which is constantly in a rat race, trying to achieve everything in the materialistic world. How can the youth tap into the Shunya Quotient, to that neutral state, and achieve their sense of calm, sense of breath, sense of heightened digestive health, heightened spiritual wellness. How can they do that? Like any simple remedies that you'd give them? You know, experience is always by contrast. So whenever you're dealing with your children or you're influencing the youngsters, the Gen Z, that what you call, there is one fundamental philosophy you must inculcate their minds with. That fundamental philosophy is that as we speak, somebody is celebrating, somebody is mourning. As we speak, somebody is honeymooning and somebody is getting raped. As we speak, somebody is celebrating birth and somebody is preparing to die. As we speak, people subconsciously are trampling over ants. Animals are eating each other. So most important, try and understand that sensitivity to life should be in place. Don't disregard this at all. Mm. Because your experience with sensitivity will make you evolve. And there is a power which is higher, yeah. but which is within. The power which is higher is within. So I always say that extraordinary are those who know there is something within them yeah. which is superior to circumstance. This is very important confidence building. Also, when people go through turbul turbulence, tell them that champions are born only with challenges. If you are not challenged, you will never become a champion. If you don't become a champion, you will not lead by example because you don't have experience to lead. Your failures will make you lead, not your success. So, You know, I'd love to engage in a rapid fire with you now. Yeah, sure. To ask you some questions and from the top of your mind, I want you to answer that. Question number one, the top three breathing techniques that we must do every single day without fail. Anulom Viloma, mm -hmm. very important. The only one pranayama which everybody should do and must do and can do. Can do. Is Anuloma Viloma. Focus on Viloma, breathing out. Don't be in a hurry to breathe in till you've completely breathed out. And even after you've breathed out in the suspended state, don't be in a hurry to breathe in till you really need the breath inside. So carbon dioxide conditioning happens. Mm. Staying without the life force brings resilience, tenacity, patience, tolerance, what yoga brings. So that's... The best one. That's and me. any other two breathing techniques that we should practice after a uh -huh. In martial arts, we were doing breathing when we did practice our kathas, which was once again taken from the Indian science of bandhas. Mm -hmm. So take a deep breath. Hold it, process it. Lock. So your glutes should be sucked in. Mm. So it's like this. Your glutes are sucked in like this and your stomach is sucked in like this. Yeah. And the oneness of the mind gut axis. Sharpness of the neuropeptides. Mm. Exonal sprouting. Density of your neural forest. Everything gets illuminated. Synaptic connections yeah. keep growing. Yeah. So with this Mahabandhas. 
and when you do it with pavan muktasan you literally train yourself to be fearless full of confidence fearless full of creativity fearless full of conviction you are god you are god because you feel like god very powerful so to tell the audience what pavan muktasan is you basically lay on your back and hold both your knees to your chest and hug it tight yeah that's pavan muktasan what's the third yogic kriya or breathing technique or asana that you would the third one would be simply i shut don't breathe in for long till you have to gently watching yourself breathe in by itself then don't breathe out at all for long hold it as long till the body releases itself you don't be the breather you be the observer and in that observation perspectives become larger than the universe perceptions become deeper than the abyss of any ocean and the division between the two eyes yeah become one kind of understanding and the unison of being and the unison of being doesn't have a sense of separation it has a sense of oneness and sense of oneness brings celebration so that kind of breathing and feeling most relaxed there So that's why in Indian culture and sciences we focus a lot on this point right when you go to a temple we put kumkum here vibhuti here chandan here the red bindi comes here for the women even men have something here when they go to a religious place right we also call this the third eye and in modern science it's also the place where the pituitary gland is right behind this yeah is that where we are trying to focus when we are breathing so different personalities receive their energy from different chakras Mm. a super intellect a super control freak mm. will be here mm. a super lovable compassionate will be here mm. a super bhogi will be here yeah. and genitals oh god so even your exit of life is from those points and then you find a perfect womb match mm. seeking mm. now in indian tradition after a person dies have you heard i have certainly read that they would hammer the skull here mm. Mm. to break open the skull so that you uh, re- you get a release it's released from here conscious sadhus sadhanas get a release without breaking this open this breaks open itself by itself it becomes universal from being individual mm. mm-hmm. so like all the yogis of like the i mean once again talking about the actual stages the buddhas the mahaviras the shivas of the world the christ the mohammeds of the world so they evolved to the level of levitation of awareness and they exited from here which was nirvana you exit from here you will come back for here you exit from here you will come back for here mm. the same energy cycle magnetic cycle keeps attracting the same thing so consciousness overrides instincts so when awakening happens you come out of the cycle of sansara vartul and you get centered you transcend the way your life ends determines the way you will, will be begin. born the way it will begin right so for a buddha to be born again it would take thousands of years for that soul to wait to find that calm womb that collected seed the the unison and the dance of creation happening in making love mm. only such wombs can attract a buddha or a mahavir you know i read in the scriptures you know i asked my dharm teacher that upon in time that why does mahavir buddha and all of them have this ring of light behind them she said they have so much knowledge and wisdom that they're burning bright like a sun and a normal human being like us cannot see them with our naked eyes so they hold all their light and wisdom at the back so that we can see their physical form so a uh, kalyan photography uh, once again a russian scientist he created such photosensitive plates mm-hmm. which could take the outlines of the forms of trees rocks flowers then they experimented on humans 
and they did decoded the certain lights so certain lights were emanating 2 inches to 4 inches to 6 inches depending how enlightened you are from within and certain colors of lights could depict mm. and determine the state of disease inside okay. yeah so now the heat signature so there is heat inside mm. there is combustion happening inside we are warm you look at even averagely warm water and if you look at look at it very minutely you will see vapors going up because it's really saying it's heat so the signature light is there in everyone and this signature of your light when absorbed even invisibly by people makes them eerie reactive or responsive interesting and they actually noticed that when the person left the frame their energy signature was still there Very, for absolutely. almost like 20 to 30 minutes absolutely if you go why do when you go to shirdi you go to the sai baba shrine you go where he was sitting or where he lived you bring back the same piece because that same piece is there and it will remain that's why we bring back rocks and pebbles from our most cherished holidays very important because the environment the vibe of that and you being reminded of it yeah. takes you back in time making you euphoric about it you relive the moment and when you relive the moment the dopamine hit the oxytocin releases to the sky we feel and relive the same memories absolutely and here we're busy trying to capture that on our phone yeah. for the gram for the social media world thinking yeah. that we can freeze happiness but that's not happening we are not we are not frozen in time and space we are not pieces of metal and wood so frozen in time and space we are ever so dynamic and fluid yeah. changing in time and space and if you are aware of what is happening now you become the choreographer of your own change if change is constant you choreograph it since you're the choreographer of your life and dr miki mehta is now 63 years old he doesn't look his age at all and and completed 44 years in the industry Yeah and he was also you were also the first one to bring the concept of holistic wellness in India. Yes. The word was not the even word used. The word holistic was not introduced in India and once I was traveling to Singapore 15 years ago uh and somebody told me in Singapore also the word holistic health had just come in. Introduced so even in Asia rather. I was uh, I was I'd gone to London visiting my aunt some 45 46 years ago and i read a book and that book was inspired by vata pitta kapha <laughs> the laws <laughs> the dincheri of eating it was i forgot that british author's name and he was talking about that 8 hours for elimination 8 hours for assimilation and yeah. then you have a 8 hour window for you to eat uh huh so that 8 hour window supposedly is from 10 in the morning to continue to whatever 6 in the evening yes and that's the time when you're you know when your hunger and your digesting capacity they both peak and they peak together when hunger peaks because your digestive capacity peaks digestive capacity peaks because your hunger peaks powerful very powerful and that and in that book i had read the word holistic what does it mean so then i said holistic i can it makes sense holy and then when i came back to india i was i was speaking to one english literature professor her name was amy darwala she was my mentor in my school she's not no more and i asked her so she said that you know she had read renan martins and thesaurus of various languages she said holy that which is holy is pure that which is holy and pure is whole that which is holy pure and whole has to be integrated that which is holy pure whole and integrated is holistic that is holistic and much more and much more in fact only in the last i think 10 12 years even in the us the word holistic wellness has started being used in hospitals yeah. by doctors and scientists that you have to look beyond the physicality of the body if you want to treat the disease absolutely you have to see beyond the realm of the body and treat the person so once again we we do a lot of serious illness management we work with icus mm-hmm. uh i'm blessed that just look as sign me up as a holistic health partner right and then we have a clinic at kambalai hospital i have a clinic there 
uh, we look after the health of nurses at Breach Candy Hospital. Nurses. Nurses. Nurse the nurses. The program is called Nurse the Nurses. Yeah. And we have a we have our center at the Tata Memorial Hospital for almost now twelve years. In the between, there was patients. a gap at Tata Memorial Hospital. So we have our association with hospitals, and they recognizing holistic health yeah. is very good. I'm very blessed. My Shunyam quotient has become a national seller. I got this news just a week ago by Penguin. I'm blessed and I'm very certain heal your gut, mind and emotions will bring a lot many celebrations. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you are catering to the nurses who nurse us. Yeah. Because they're the most neglected community within the medical community. We also look after the BMC lady sweepers. This I do with mm -hmm. Amrita Madam for The ones who are invisible to us. Yeah. This I do it for the foundation, Divyash Foundation, which is promoted by Amrutaji Fadnavis. We also, we work with, now we work with lady constables and lady police officers. Yeah. And in the conditions they work, the kind of support they need from us, we work with them. We work with the security of the film city at Goregaon. Yeah. We've done a lot of work at Palgar. We worked with jail inmates. All thank you to Divya's foundation and Amrita ji. She's doing a great job. I get this opportunity to do and to do things, and I feel blessed. So as much I worked with a super privileged class, as much I worked with the underprivileged class. We because because we do bespoke wellness customized individualized personalized home to home 8 10 team of 8 to 10 people looking after you in multiple cities in bombay yeah. people think that oh we are very expensive but i take every call even if they cannot pay i give them a free consultation on phone free and for people who are in bombay they can't even afford the medicines a uh, at my center between 12 and 4 the center is filled with all clients which are gratis wow. because we want to look after them. We don't want to say no to anybody and we, we spend for the medicines from our pocket. So when we do superfoods, herbal supplementation, we do whatever we can from our pocket. That's very powerful. In fact, this reminds me of what my grandfather has said to me time and again. Service to humanity is a rent you pay to live on this planet. See this Sufi? <laughs> yeah. You take it from here. Yeah. You're the transit point. And you leave it back here. Very the transit far. point. Very far. So why they do the Sufi twirl and while they are swirling, yeah. that is the time they are constantly into energy seeking and energy giving away. So they are neutralizing themselves. They are just a transit point celebrating the moment. Celebrating the moment. Yeah. I love, uh, you know, the things that I learn in conversation with you because it always leaves me in much thought about what I need to change, improve, add, delete in my life to move to the next step because evolution is the only thing that we must be in charge of rather than being at the mercy of the elements. Absolutely. You put attention, start putting attention to the things that draw you closer, which vibe well with you. That is a time you, the other weak things will wither. You don't have to drop them, give them up, nothing. I recently made a reel which is not yet released. It's called Wipe Bath. Mm -hmm. So, bath of vibrations. Wipe bath. Yeah, so I'm taking a great wipe bath from you because of this vibrations. environment. So, when I go to temples, yeah. mosques, shrines, I take, I go for pilgrimages, I do Shakti Peeth regularly. I have a small group. Every month we travel. With the, for pilgrimages only for vibe bath very powerful and you go there inside and you're showered you don't need a soap you don't need a shampoo you don't need a deodorant you don't need a perfume all you need is to be you're absorbing like a sponge yeah like everything that's in the air and the atmosphere is electrifying and you're letting your Completely. body absorb all of that and you become very coherent in your head and heart where you come to terms with life yeah. with choice not out of no choice with choice. So, what you've created here is like an impression of soft on soft clay. And that impression is so deep and so profound. It's up to us to take those learnings in and evolve into the highest, healthiest, most conscious, aware version of ourselves. Not only I pray that this particular episode of your many podcasts do well, I pray that everything that you ever say and write reaches out the smallest crevices of mankind and the animals 
and the you know the vegetation kind the farms and the mountains because they are also listening so far. they are also absorbing they are also changing rivers are evaporating yeah. lakes are getting dirtier or cleaner oceans are turbulent silent still everything is happening they are also changing this is like the most divine blessing and, i've ever and received we, <laughs> and we and we can influence the tatvas we can influence the panchmahabhuta yeah so spirit in the human life form is more powerful than spirit without a body do you know that yeah because you have the power to change and return and you know that reminds me again this is another point i keep bringing up my grandfather he said and all, all my dharmic teachers also said you know the ones who taught me the scriptures that suicide is one of the greatest sins you could commit against your own spirit yes because then your soul has to haunt that many years of your life that is left to be lived without a body without the ability to communicate without the ability to engage with someone else yeah. right no matter how difficult your life gets i hope those who are listening come back to this conversation find that motivation find that inspiration to be a another day for yourself for your parents for your teachers for your friends for your siblings for your children for your partner and everyone who depends on you to smile to live and to spread that happiness because you matter absolutely that you the individual the indivisible duality in that individual what is you know the etymology of the word individual is the indivisible duality indivi dual indivisible duality that you are in constant epistemological humility in wilderment wandering how does the coconut water so sweet climb up 200 feet <laughs> how come a flower so fragile smells so sweet how come fruits which don't look so good from outside yet from inside are juicy and sweet mm. this is beauty of life just live it like a child in epistemological humility and become childlike and simply enjoy the miracles coming your way powerful i leave you with that powerful sentence a powerful quote and idea and inspiration from dr miki mehta and i leave you with this powerful idea this powerful conversation that you can come back to again and again to draw inspiration from because the number of times you listen to it you'll come across deeper meanings that you didn't realize in your first attempt because that's how deep this conversation has been even for me i'm going to revisit it multiple times I leave you with this thought with this idea and I wish you become the healthiest happiest kindest most aware conscious version of yourselves here's to healthy living and a healthy you thank you dimple